So, um, unfortunately, Dr. Gomez wasn't able to come today, so um, I'm going to try my best to fill in for him. My, my name is Dave Renault. I'm from the University of Guelph in Ontario. So through this presentation, it's basically talking about an outbreak investigation that happened on one of the farms that was in close proximity to the university, and I'll just kind of walk you through the, that, you know, the presentation of the cases and, and how they work through them. Uh, Dago had no financial disclosures to make at any point during this presentation. So Samuel Dublin is a, is a multi-drug resistant uh, bacterial infection um, that has really become an emerging threat in Canada. Um, historically, it's been mostly found in the northwestern part of, or northeastern part of the United States, um, with sporadic cases occurring in Alberta, a province in a western province in uh, Canada. But uh, recently, some cases have started to occur in, in Quebec and also in Ontario. So the first case that was diagnosed in Ontario was actually in 2014, and since then, it's been uh, becoming more and more common. It's also a, a disease that has a potential zoonotic threat. Um, it can cause severe invasive infections, particularly in susceptible humans or young, um, young humans or, um, or older uh, humans as well. An issue with the control of Salmonella Dublin is that we have these uh, carriers that are showing no clinical signs, and they look perfectly healthy. Um, but we can have these carriers that are shedding massive amounts of Salmonella Dublin in their feces. And these are the ones that are responsible for really the, the endemic infections that are occurring uh, within herds and also the spread um, that's happening between herds, especially in naive herds. So the objective of this presentation is really to walk you through um, an investigation and also analysis and management and outbreak of septicemia um, associated with salmon L. Dublin occurring in a large dairy farm. So this particular dairy farm um, was a, quite a well-managed farm. Uh, they milked around 700 cows. Um, they're located in the southwest, southwestern portion of Ontario, Canada. They had really good uh, calf pan management uh, where they all housed individually and they cleaned them out uh, between each calf. They again had, had really excellent calf and heifer management where they fed uh, high volumes of colostrum, uh, six liters within the first uh, 12 hours. They fed them high, high volumes of milk, so 12 to 15 percent of their body weight and pasteurized whole milk. But one of the main issues that, we, that Diego and his group found on this farm was that they're buying a, or purchasing a lot of heifers from Quebec um, into the farm for recipients for their embryo transfer program on this farm. They also had no quarantine period uh, for these heifers, so they're basically introducing all these heifers um, and commingling them with their other heifer groups that were um, you know, started on their own farm. And I'll, I'll get to the uh, yeah, part after. The calf barn, um, so again, individually housed for the first uh, 60 days. And then once they're weaned, the, the partitions that are seen in the middle here were pulled out and they're pair housed for, um, for two weeks and then they're moved into uh, group housing. And again, they had you know, positive pressure ventilation and it, it was quite a well-managed uh, calf facility. So the history of the outbreak, um, over a three-month period, um, from winter to the spring season, the farm experienced a significant outbreak or an increase in the amount of uh, cases of septicemia that they're finding on the farms. They had five calves in particular of those group of sept or calves exhibiting signs of septicemia that were aged between two to 10 weeks of age um, that died. Um, four of the calves were really in close proximity to each other. Um, well, one of the calves that died um, was found in the barn that they normally use for isolating some sick animals. If we look at the clinical signs of these calves, uh, three of the calves had um, respiratory signs and fever prior to them dying. Um, one had diarrhea and fever, and then one also died without any clinical symptoms uh, prior to death. The four calves that were uh, found with clinical signs were treated pretty extensively with antibiotics. Um, in fact, they're, on, they're treated for about two to five weeks um, with antibiotics and received around two to three um, antibiotics before they actually went on to die. Uh, Postmortems were done on all these calves and they're submitted to the Animal Health Laboratory in, uh, in Guelph or just uh, close to this farm. And they found that all the calves had very consistent signs of septicemia. So they had enlarged uh, livers, they had uh, petechial hemorrhages that were found um, throughout the, uh, the body cavity. It was also interesting to note that all five of these calves had uh, superlative bronchopneumonia as well, as you can see um, in this picture with consolidation occurring in the cranioventral portion of the lung. And three of the calves also had superlative enteritis. 
they did uh, culture on all, all of these cases as well, and they identified that uh, there's a Salmonella group D or Salmonella Dublin that was isolated from all five of these cases. If you look at the uh, resistant profile, which was determined by a Kirby-Bauer method, um, so again, they found uh, Seminole Group D in all, th all of the uh, cases at quite high levels, and it had virtually the same resistance profile, whereas resistant to ampicillin, ceftiofur, uh, kenamycin, uh, sulfanamides, and tetracycline, and it was susceptible to spectinomycin and trimethoprim sulfa. This group then uh, did uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis, and basically the purpose of this was to see, are all these strains the same? So are all the, the isolates that they found in these calves the exact same? And virtually the pattern that was found in this uh, gel electrophoresis was identical for each calf, suggesting that it was, uh, this, in fact, the same strain that was causing um, these diseases, or this disease outbreak. What they did as a follow-up for this is they went out and, and they tried to find if there are any carriers that were within the population. Um, so they did some surveillance and they looked at uh, fecal culturing um, of 100 pre-weaned calves, uh, 35 of which were sick. They looked at 100 heifers, uh, 20 of which were sick. Um, and they also looked at 100 milking cows, uh, 25 of the milking cows were sick. And they took a variety of environmental samples. And what was quite interesting is that they, they didn't find any um, Seminole Dublin in any of the fecal cultures that they, they did. Um, in fact, um, they found a non-group non D Seminella um, in three of the diuretic calves, cows that they cultured. The bulk tank they tested using a PCR, and it was also negative for Seminole Dublin. So after they found that, um, they uh, put in place uh, several um, biosecurity principles um, for this particular farm um, that were not in place before they started this. So this farm, 700 cow dairy, they, they didn't have any foot baths or they didn't change uh, any of their clothing or equipment before they entered into the calf facility. So potentially that would, could be the uh, potential um, you know, entry of that uh, Seminole Dublin into the, into the barn. So what they did was they changed their coveralls. They had specific coveralls that were put in place for that particular barn. They washed their boots um, uh, with a Vircon solution. Um, they didn't wear hazmat suits, but uh, this is just a picture, I guess, of a, probably a foot and mouth outbreak um, from somewhere not in Canada. Um, but they, the transportation vehicle that they used for calves, they also cleaned and disinfected. They also implemented a, a sick calf pen uh, where all calves that were being treated for pneumonia or diarrhea were moved into this pen um, until they um, basically resolved their clinical signs so that they could potentially reduce the amount of spreading. And finally, the last thing that they did was they, um, they all the heifers that they're buying for embryo transfer, uh, they moved into um, a specific barn that was made for those particular recipients so that there's not any commingling that was occurring um, with their homegrown calves. As a follow-up, um, so they continued to do ongoing surveillance in this farm uh, where all uh, the dead animals were necropsied and, and samples were sent in uh, looking specifically for Seminole Dublin. And as of the last follow-up that uh, Diego had with this farm, there's no further cases that they had. So some recommendations that Diego and the group kind of made to, to kind of limit the spread or to control Seminole Dublin for coming into this farm again was that they suggested that they had a little bit more strict, uh, stricter biosecurity principles that were applied specifically to those replacement animals and those that were coming in for embryo transfer. So what they started to do is they started to do um, uh, blood tests or antibody tests using an ELISA, and they, they, they did that prior to purchase. Um, if you look at some of the literature there, um, it's not tremendously sensitive, but what they've implemented on this farm is that they've tested all the incoming replacement animals at 100 and then again at 200 days of age. And that's been shown to have uh, increased sensitivity in identifying some of these Seminole Dublin carriers. They've also decided to choose replacements from herds that have known disease status. So all the, all the herds that they're buying from are PCR negative on their bulk tank. They've transported all incoming animals directly from the farm of origin to this farm. Um, so there's no longer commingling or mixing, uh, which has been known to potentially lead to some of the spread um, of this, uh, of this uh, pathogen. And they've also isolated all new arrivals for a minimum of four weeks before they um, enter into the facility. Another thing that they've implemented is that for all visitors, they must have, uh, they must wear farm boots that they provide, as well as coveralls uh, for them as well. 
So some conclusions of this outbreak. Um, it was speculated that Salmonella Dublin really came through these uh, heifers that were uh, coming into the farm um, really of unknown disease status. And due to the poor biosecurity principles that are applied in this farm, it was suspected that potentially one of these heifers that was brought in was shedding it through their feces and through the lack of, of uh, cleaning their boots, they potentially transmitted it to those, some of those newborn calves. Um, the cluster of uh, the mortalities and also the, the uh, pulse gel electrophoresis, again, indicative that a single salmonella Dublin uh, clone was the cause of the outbreak. And potentially that's related to um, maybe a lack of biosecurity principles, again, being applied on this. Um, because of the nice prompt surveillance that they did and in the institution of biosecurity principles, they've kind of um, helped to kind of prevent or um, reduce the salmonella Dublin outbreak on this farm and hopefully prevent it from uh, occurring again. So with that, I'd like to take any questions.